Welcome to ATP Report. I'm your host, Barry Nussbaum. We have a wonderful special guest today. Robert Spencer is going to join us. Uh, Robert, as many of you know, is a scholar on Islam and Islamists, both domestic and international. He is the author of nearly uh, two dozen books. Uh, he's the creator and boss of Jihad Watch, and Robert has a brand new book out that we're going to talk about today. Uh, the new book is titled Rating America's Presidents. It's super relevant as we approach the election in just a few weeks' time. Uh, very important topic for today. Welcome, Robert. Thanks for coming on. It's great to be uh, here, Barry, to talk to you again. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for making the time. So let's, let's start off. So Robert, your new book is out, Rating America's Presidents. Let's start at the beginning. Father of our country, George Washington. When I was growing up, there was nobody who was as unassailable in American history as George Washington. How do you rate him? I have him as one of the four greatest. And so if I were remodeling Mount Rushmore, I would first leave Washington where he is. But uh, uh, there are a couple of other surprises in that for later on. Uh, Washington, in the first place, set the tone and established the precedents for what a president ought to be. And he established the federal power as a real thing. Whereas previously in the Articles of Confederation, federal power was very weak and the states were essentially on their own, which would ultimately have led almost inevitably to disunion and probably to wars between various states, uh, such that perhaps North America would look today like Africa, where there are 49 countries and many of them quite hostile to one another. Uh, but George Washington prevented all that, establishing uh, strong federal power, putting down notably the Whiskey Rebellion, which I think is uh, one of the greatest names in American history. The Whiskey Rebellion was whiskey uh, manufacturers uh, just declaring they weren't going to pay the tax that had been set on their whiskey. And he uh, made sure that that did not happen and that it was very clear that the federal government was no paper tiger. But probably the most important thing George Washington did for nowadays is actually leave office because uh, in the first place, they wanted to make him king. And he said that he was not, there was not gonna, they were not gonna set up a new monarchy after they just left the old one. Uh, they were going to have a republic and a republic was characterized not by rulers, but by public servants, which he meant to be a real thing and not just an empty phrase. And so he served the public for eight years as president and then he went home. He did not cling to power for his own self-aggrandizement until death, which he very easily could have done. He's still the only president who was elected unanimously, and he was elected unanimously twice. The uh, fact that he left office established the idea that the president should voluntarily relinquish power and that this is a noble and good thing to do. Now, People take that for granted nowadays in the United States, or at least they did until 2016 and this year. But the fact is that most of the countries around the world do not have that kind of tradition. And most of the transitions that they have from one ruler to another can, are uh, bitter at very least and uh, quite often bloody as well. So I'm thankful that what I learned in first and second grade because I went to Washington Elementary School. <laughs> and I still remember his, his plaque out front. Uh, so he's still one of the good guys in Robert Spencer's mind. So in the 19th century, you've got the Industrial Revolution, you've got the abolitionist movement, you've got the Civil War, and so much more history. And the left now considers this the century of racism and um, the founding principles of the country being refined uh, into this horrible period of oppression that carries on to this day. Um, how do you rate that time period? And is the, is the left wrong or right? Oh, I it mean, couldn't be more wrong. 
yeah, is the left right? No, the left is not right. It is left. It is wrong. It's a vicious caricature to say that the 19th century is just the century of racism. In the first place, the United States is one of the only countries that had slavery, that abolished slavery as the result of a moral crusade that was based on principles that are derived from the founding idea of the country itself. In other words, the Declaration of Independence says that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That was the death blow to slavery right there. It took decades for this to become clear, but slavery could never have existed on an indefinite basis in the United States because of that principle. In other countries, slavery was abolished because of Christian principles or because of other factors, pressure from outside powers. But in the United States, it was part of our founding philosophy that did slavery in. That's one thing that doesn't get enough attention nowadays. Another is that uh, after the Civil War, that we fought a bloody Civil War and thousands of people were killed ultimately to abolish slavery. Now this is controverted to a tremendous degree nowadays and actually always has been because Abraham Lincoln, for example, said, if I could save the union without freeing a single slave, I would do it. People throw that out nowadays as if to say that Abraham Lincoln did not care to free the slaves, which only is a manifestation of either dishonesty or historical ignorance. Abraham Lincoln was a deeply committed abolitionist who actually articulated the principles that led to the abolition of slavery in a direct sense after 40 years of compromises. First, the Compromise of 1820, the Missouri Compromise, and then several other compromises after that attempted to establish the nation half slave, half free. And Lincoln made it very clear, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And he explained why that was and why slavery could not in endure in the United States, but he was also a politician and a pragmatist. And so he was looking for the best way to do that. But very few other nations have fought major wars that ultimately centered around slavery. And even after that, when the Democrats instituted the solid South of Jim Crow and denied black Americans their civil rights, there were Republican presidents who were speaking out, notably Ulysses Grant, speaking out for those civil rights all the way through the latter half of the 19th century. So uh, the 19th century in the United States compared to many other areas of the world, and I don't think that's an illegitimate comparison, we have to be realistic about what's possible to say, well, the United States had slavery and it's terrible. Yeah, well, everybody else had slavery too. <laughs> in, in comparison to the real world, the United States comes off very well. So Let's go to the 20th century um, with the birth of socialism as a movement, communism around the world. Um, the, there were periods where you had a very socialistic, strong federal government that literally turned things upside down. I'm referring to Roosevelt, uh, who is still beloved on the left. And then you had Reagan on the right, who is universally uh, still looked at by, I'd say, the progressives as some sort of dictator, crazy guy that, uh, that <laughs> I remember being in school and hearing the same things I'm hearing now, then they say about Trump, they used to say about Reagan, you know? Oh, yeah. So um, is it simply that it was lefts and progressives and socialists against more free America, or is there something more complex that changed in the 20th century politically? Well, the 20th century was indeed the dawning of the progressive era. And I discussed that in the book, uh, how the progressives, even the name is dishonest because it assumes that they're correct and that history is moving in their direction. And so they're the ones who are progressing, whereas you and I, Barry, apparently we're regressing and we'll be Neanderthals soon, whereas the progressives are marching confidently into the socialist future. This is a, a big trick played on the United States and the world. There's nothing progressive about the progressives. 
they are just big government statists. But if they come out and say, we're big government statists who want to control every aspect of your life, that's not as electable or catchy. <coughs> Excuse me. So they call themselves progressives. And so right from the beginning, I discussed the 1896 election that uh, was William uh, Jennings Bryan of the Democratic Party versus the Republican William McKinley. And Bryan is one of the earliest progressive candidates. And I note that he and Woodrow Wilson, who was the first, arguably the first progressive president, although in many ways it was Theodore Roosevelt, but uh, these people all equated giving power to the people with giving power to the government. And we, we hear this dishonest rhetoric even today. Brian, had, Brian ran for president three times and lost all three. He was a very appealing character in many ways personally, but very dangerous ideas. And uh, he had a campaign poster the last time he ran in 1908 that uh, had his slogan as, shall the people rule? But he didn't really want the people to rule. What did that mean to Brian? It meant, shall we have government control and socialistic measures that uh, confiscate the wealth from some people and give it to others? Yeah, that's what he meant. And yeah, that's not as marketable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, you have that principle being enunciated by Woodrow Wilson quite explicitly. You know, he was a professor before he became president, and he wrote some very critical works about the U.S. Constitution, saying that what we really need is an authoritarian ruler who will get things done and not be bound by all these constitutional minutiae. It's kind of scary to think he became president after that, and then imprisoned people for exercising their First Amendment rights to oppose World War I. Uh, but all that comes out of the same progressivism, that he was the enlightened. He knew what was best for us. He knew we should be involved in this war that was essentially based on internationalist principles, make the world safe for democracy. And so he had to silence forcibly those who dissented. Robert, tell people who are watching today how they can get in touch with you, where they can find your book, and where they can keep up with all the stuff you produce. Yeah, Rating America's Presidents is at Amazon. It's at barnesandnoble.com. It should be at any uh, brick and mortar bookstore if any of those still exist. And uh, if they don't have it, ask them to order it. I know a lot of them will be terrible leftists, but uh, you might mention something like the First Amendment or something of that kind. And you're right to read whatever you want to read and that they are businessmen and your money is just as green as anybody else's. Good oh, and I'm at jihadwatch.org and jihadwatchrs on Twitter. Perfect. And for those of you out there that haven't subscribed to our text message alert system, please take out your cell phones, type the word truth, T-R-U-T-H, and send it to 88202, push send. You'll be automatically subscribed. You'll get all of our shows like this one with Robert Spencer for free on your cell phone. Uh, absolutely no cost, and all you got to do is look down into the palm of your hand. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Newsbaum.